and a fine Saturday morning to all of you. This is Russ Barkley, back with your Saturday Research Review. By the way, I want to start out by thanking everyone who responded to my survey, asking you about how to structure these weekly research reviews. And it turned out to be almost equally divided. Uh, um, Nearly half thought that the reviews were fine as is, but it would help to put more information in the title of the review so that it would help people decide whether to see it and whether or not uh, they could even find it in a search of the channel. On the other hand, about half, a little more than half actually, said I should break the reviews up into individual studies. Uh, And what I'm going to do is split the baby, so to speak. If I think that the research study deserves individual comment, I'll go ahead and peel it off and do a separate shorter video on that research article. On the other hand, if I think that the research article isn't all that significant, I'll just go ahead and review it on Saturday like I do with the other research reviews. So uh, let's see if we can make everybody happy with these changes. As always, we're going to start with some dad jokes. These come to us from the website keeplaughingforever.com. So here you go. You're going to have to think about some of these, especially this first one. Listen up. A man was recently hospitalized with six plastic horses inside of him. The doctor is describing his condition as stable. (laughs) Think about it. Okay, here's another one. I can always tell if someone is lying just by looking at them. I can also tell if they're standing. (laughs) Tricked you on that one. Okay, it's a five-minute walk from my house to the pub, but it's 35-minute walk from the pub back to my house. The difference is staggering. (laughs) And finally, here's a pretty good one. You got to think about this one too now. I have a Polish friend who's a sound musician. Oh, and a Czech one too. Czech one too. Czech one too. All right, that's enough. We'll have more next week. Onward to our four research articles for this week. As always, the links are in the description for this video. First up is a small study that involved 55 adults with ADHD and half of them were subjected to transcranial direct current stimulation. Now this is where a very low amount of electrical current is induced, if you will, or transduced through the skull into the brain and it results in some changes in brain functioning, especially under the area of the skull where it is being transduced. So this has been tried before as a possible treatment for ADHD. I reviewed it earlier. Uh, The results are rather inconsistent. I might do another review on it later. There uh, seems to be a meta-analysis out about that, but let's just talk about this study. So we have these adults, and direct current was sent into the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So right here over the left frontal lobe. And they gave the individuals several cognitive tests of attention, inhibition, and so on. They also subjected half of these individuals to sham stimulation, a very important sort of a placebo effect. So what they found is that among those who were diagnosed with ADHD and enrolled in the study and given direct current stimulation. So about 25 individuals were given the stimulation. What did they find? Some improvement in measures of impulse control, but not on any other measures of ADHD symptoms or cognitive functioning. And they found no benefits among the non-ADHD adults in the study that received the stimulation. So it appeared to be only beneficial for the adults with ADHD and only on measures of inhibition. Now let's keep in mind these psychological tests are not correlated with behavior in the real world, so it's kind of hard to say how this would have changed real world functioning. But it is a way of showing that the left prefrontal cortex might have some involvement in impulse control in people with ADHD. We kind of already knew that anyway, but it was an interesting study, I thought, and the results 
uh, I thought were worth bringing to your attention. So that's our first study, and that appeared over in the journal Clinical Neuropsychiatry. Next up is an article that appeared over in the Journal of Affective Disorders. This is a study of mitochondrial DNA. Now, this is the DNA that's inside a separate part of each cell that contains the mitochondria, which are involved in producing energy and metabolism within each cell. So the DNA here is different, it's separate that is, from the DNA typically found in the cell nucleus. And there's been some interest in looking at whether or not psychiatric disorders might be related to altered genes and their expression in the mitochondria themselves. And that's what this paper is looking at. And they looked at various psychiatric disorders. Uh, but what they found is that one gene in mitochondrial DNA that gene is the RMDN1, if that's of interest to you, that gene was associated with altered risk for ADHD. Depending upon which variant of the gene an individual received, they might have higher or lower risk. Specifically, they found that an increase in one standard deviation in the expression of this gene was associated with a 12% lower risk of ADHD. So that, that's sort of interesting. Uh, at this point, not a lot of work has been done on mitochondrial DNA. I know a lot of people think that uh, ADHD might arise from problems with the metabolism in the body. Uh, that's just a hypothesis at the moment. There's very little research to support that idea. This could purely be an association, not a causal link between the two. So we have to be very careful on how we interpret this result, but I thought you might want to know that there is some research going on now on mitochondrial DNA and ADHD. The third paper I want to talk about today is a review and meta-analysis of the relationship between ADHD and atopic dermatitis. This review found 49 studies in the literature that met their inclusion criteria uh, for review and meta-analysis. And the overall results of the analysis showed that among patients that had atopic dermatitis, ADHD was about 34% more likely to occur in conjunction with that condition. Now, the opposite is also true. Among patients with ADHD, they found that there was about a 45% increase in risk of them having atopic dermatitis. So there appears to be a bidirectional relationship between these two, an association, remember, not causation, but it does fit with a number of earlier findings from individual studies of such a relationship. Being a meta-analysis, of course, the results of the study seem to be more robust than we would see in an individual study. They did some subgroup analyses and found that the risk of ADHD among those with severe atopic dermatitis was two and a half times greater. So suggesting that the more severe the dermatitis, the greater the odds of having ADHD with it. Uh, also, they found that those individuals had other allergic conditions, multiple allergic conditions, and were also more likely to have sleeping difficulties. So it looks like there's a constellation of things that may go along with that autoimmune disorder of atopic dermatitis that might link up with ADHD. So again, interesting paper there. I thought you ought to know about that finding as well. Last up is going to be a very large study done in the U.S., on prescription stimulant use, misuse, and abuse disorder in adults uh, between 18 and 64. And the study is, this particular paper, is examining all of those adults who are recorded as taking 
prescription stimulants. We assume that they're taking them for ADHD, though keep in mind stimulants are sometimes given for other purposes, such as narcolepsy. Uh, what did they find in this study, which by the way was published over at JAMA Psychiatry? They found, first of all, that the 83,762 adults that were sampled in the study they found that among those that were using prescription stimulants, about 25% of them reported misusing a stimulant. So now misuse could simply be something like taking a dose uh, additional to what is prescribed for you. It could be taking it at a different time than what is prescribed for you. It doesn't imply abuse, just that the drug is being used beyond what it was prescribed to do. More importantly, 9% of those on prescription stimulants were abusing the stimulant. They qualified for a stimulant use disorder. And of those, the vast majority were using stimulants. Keep in mind, about three quarters of those who were, uh, who had a substance use disorder, excuse me, about three quarters of those were misusing their own prescribed stimulant. But another 10% or so were abusing other stimulants as well that weren't prescribed to them. Uh, so again, overall, 9% of people with a prescription for stimulants in adults may be abusing the drug. So not an awful lot, 91% aren't, but among those who are misusing and abusing the drug, it appears to be the amphetamines that are being misused and abused, not methylphenidate. So just thought you might want to know about that finding as well. All right, everybody, that's it for this Saturday. As always, I deeply appreciate your watching this channel and especially these research reviews and hope you find them enjoyable. I'll do my best to reformat them so that they're more um, searchable and understandable from the title. Uh, and of course, I always appreciate the subscribers to this channel and appreciate you recommending this channel to others. So thanks everybody for joining me. I'll see you again next week. Until then, live well, be well, and take care. Bye for now.